Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, as Mary mentioned, we're moving in 12 days and uh, going to be, the Lord willing, in a new home. But you too are moving. We don't know when you're moving. But if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you can look forward to a new home. And uh, we're going to be reading about that new home today in Revelation chapter 21. So if you want to turn there, we'll uh, dig in and finish our study of this great book that God has given us to help us prepare for the future. We've come in our study to the last section of the future aspect of the book. Um, we've looked at revelation concerning the tribulation period, the millennium, and now we come to the new heavens and the new earth and what that will look like in chapter 21. Uh, the first verse says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. This, of course, takes us back to Genesis 1.1, doesn't it? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth, and this is what John saw in his vision. Now, as we go through this section, remember that this is a vision. Um, like John has seen other things that are comparable to reality, he's going to see things that are comparable to what we are familiar with in this chapter as well. The heaven, of course, refers to what is above us from the earth's surface. Uh, Paul talks about three heavens the first being the atmosphere, the second being outer space, and the third being the uh, residence of God. This is the first two heavens that are above the new earth that John saw in his vision. Isaiah, at the end of his prophecy, also referred to new heavens and a new earth, and you may want to go back and reread that sometime soon in connection with this chapter. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away. Well, how did it pass away? Well, we're not sure. Some theologians speculate that God will create ex nihilo, out of nothing, new heavens and a new earth, like he created the present heavens and earth. Others believe that he is going to renovate the present heavens and earth and so completely change them in that regard. I think we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> I'm not going to be dogmatic about that. Why is he doing this? Well, because the present heavens and the present earth have been so thoroughly corrupted by sin as a result of the fall and the consequences of human sinfulness that they are no longer fit for human habitation. And so he is going to create something new, brand new. And there is no longer any sea. This is one of seven new things in this chapter that God creates. As we have mentioned before, the sea is symbolic in the Old Testament of chaos and uh, what is antagonistic to humankind and that may be a connotation of the word here. Our present earth, of course, is covered with water three quarters of the way around. Uh, three quarters of this earth's surface is water. So, and it contributes to all kinds of phenomenon in life. Rain, uh, it affects transportation. You can just imagine what an earth without sea would be like, be totally different, and it would be, uh, there would be no barriers to getting around anymore like there are at present times. So um, this is one indication of the new 
um, condition that's going to prevail. Now, as we compare this new heaven and new earth with the old heaven and the old earth, we can see several things have been changed or will be changed by the Lord in the future. Verses 2 through 8 talk about, give us John's first vision of the new Jerusalem, which is a city on the new earth that he saw. And in verses 2 through 4, we have the record of the descent of the city and an angelic announcement that accompanies that, which John saw and heard in his vision. Verse 2, and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Well, why Jerusalem? Well, Jerusalem was the holy city, but it wasn't so holy in Old Testament times. But it will be a holy city in the future. Holy, of course, means set apart. And it is set apart to God as a pure city in contrast to the old city. The book of Revelation has been described as a tale of two cities. The city of Babylon and the city of Jerusalem. We have seen quite a bit of revelation about the city of Babylon. It arose from the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, where men said, let us gather together and build a city that will reach to heaven and we will make a name for ourselves. And we've mentioned before the two aspects of their sin was their self-centered pride and uh, or the desire to make a name for themselves and trying to get to God on their own will build a city that will reach to heaven. <clears throat> Those two things were characteristic of the Tower of Babel and they continue to be characteristic of Babylon so much so that Babylon became kind of a code word for those two things. And together they form the world system that the New Testament warns us as Christians about. Love not the world, neither the things in the world. Don't get caught up in this self-serving, self-glorification attempt to get to God on your own. Jerusalem, on the other hand, is the very antithesis of that. Babel means confusion or chaos. Jerusalem means the city of peace. Now peace, shalom, in Hebrew, refers not just to the ending of cessation, uh, the cessation of antagonism, between two parties, but it is the ultimate peace, the fullness of God's blessing. Whereas man made Babel, God gave Jerusalem to the Israelites. He told Moses in Deuteronomy, when you enter the promised land, I'm going to give you a place where I will put my name and there you will come and worship me. So when the Israelites entered the promised land and subdued their enemies, and David came to the throne, God gave the city of Jerusalem to the Israelites. It's interesting, they didn't even have to engage in war to get it. In fact, David didn't win Jerusalem from the Jebusites, the native people. One of his soldiers tricked the Jebusites and thereby God put it in the hands of the Israelites. God literally gave it to David and to the Israelites. So you see the contrast between Babylon asserting itself 
and Jerusalem being given by God. Now, Babylon reached its height during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. He, he uh, boasted that he had made Babylon great. Is not this Babylon the great that I have made with my wisdom, he said. Solomon was the very opposite of that. When Solomon came to the throne, God said to Solomon, what would you like me to give you? Solomon could have said, I want power. I want wisdom. I want wealth, which is everything that Nebuchadnezzar was out to get and did get. But Solomon didn't say that. He said, what? Give me wisdom so that I can rule your people well. This is very non-self-serving. See, he was bent on glorifying God. He had learned well from his father David. That was the passion of David's heart, to glorify God. That's why he brought the ark into Jerusalem and into the temple, uh, or Solomon brought the temple, uh, ark into the temple later. It's to glorify God. So these two cities, you see, are in, in a direct contrast as we go through this chapter. The New Jerusalem, notice, coming down out of heaven from God. God gives the, nation, the, the city to the world. They don't have to earn it. They don't have to fight for it like they did for Babylon, like the people of Babel did. It is a gift from God, and it's prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Mary and I lived in England for a year, and we learned there that uh, the reason most young married couples get married in June is because in the Middle Ages in England, the weather did not warm up enough in the springtime for people to take baths. And most people took a bath once or twice a year at that time. But when it got to be June, they could take a bath, and so the bride would take a bath and get ready for her husband. And so the tradition followed that June was a good month to get married in, you see. So this bride is adorned for her husband. She's made pure and clean. Now, who is the bride? Well, she's identified in verse 9 as the city of Jerusalem. Now, that may seem a bit confusing because we're used to thinking of the bride of Christ as the church, right? That's a figure that's used for the church in the New Testament frequently. But in the Old Testament, the bride of Christ was Israel. Now the bride of, of the Lamb is the New Jerusalem. It's simply a way of describing different groups of people. Not that all those groups are the same thing, but it's a way of describing a wonderful relationship between people between God's people and himself. So what is the New Jerusalem? Well, I believe it is a symbolic representation of the place that Jesus had in mind when he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So John sees in a vision this city coming down as a gift from God to the new earth. Excuse me, verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, this is the throne in heaven, probably an angel, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among the people. 
God's dwelling place is among his people. All through the Old Testament, we read that when God wanted to bless his people, he said he would dwell among them. The greatest blessing that people can have is to have an intimate relationship with God. That's true of us. The Holy Spirit dwells in believers. God is in us. But the tabernacle of God is going to be among his people in our future home. And he will dwell among them and they shall be his peoples, plural, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be any death, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The former things have passed away. A hospital ship was about to dock in New York and an army officer stopped at the bedside of a wounded soldier. Uh, he inquired uh, if there was any items that this soldier wanted to be sure to in be included among his belongings when he left the ship, memorabilia from the war. And the soldier said, nothing at all, sir. Do you, mean, do you mean to tell me that after all you've been through and suffered, asked the officer, you have no souvenirs to help you remember the war? No, sir, I don't, the scarred veteran replied. All I want of that war is a faint recollection of it. And I think that's probably all we'll be interested in too when we get to our heavenly home. The faint recollection. I don't know about you, but I usually forget most of my dreams. And I think in heaven we'll kind of forget most of what happened on this earth. If not all of it, who knows? The divine announcement, verses 5 through 8. And he who sits on the throne said, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these things are faithful and true. So we need to pay attention to this. I don't know about you, but I've read several books about what's coming in the future. People have died and been dead for a while. They resuscitate and they see about, talk about seeing lights and uh, hearing angelic voices. All that's interesting. But this stuff is faithful and true. I think we ought to get our ideas of heaven from revelation rather than from other reading. Amen. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. First and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Uh, I am the beginning and the end. I am the everlasting God, the creator and the concluder of everything that is going to happen. This title was used in the earlier part of the book of God as well. And it reminds us of uh, his eternality. You and I are going to live forever in the future as God is eternal. Um, there is the idea afloat that eternity means a timeless existence that time will cease. Sometimes we hear that expression used, when time ceases. That is an unbiblical concept. That comes out of Platonic philosophy, Greek philosophy. The Bible's perspective is time without end. It goes on forever and ever. And uh, you and I, uh, time is the way we measure the relationship of events to one another. And events will continue to transpire forever and ever. So there will be time, but it will be endless time. 
Hard for us to imagine that. But uh, God is that. He doesn't have a beginning. He doesn't have an ending. He has always existed. We had beginnings, but we will live forever. Every human being that has been created will live forever in one of two places. I will give water to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. Recalls Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well, doesn't it? Where he said, if you're thirsty, I will give you water and it will spring up within you uh, to be a well of water. So again, Jesus, this is something that God gives those who are in this city without cost. He gives it. It's free. We don't have to try and earn our way to heaven. God is going to give us all that will sustain our lives throughout eternity. The one who overcomes will inherit these things. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 refer to overcomers frequently, and I believe they refer to all believers who have overcome um, Satan and sin because of the blood of Christ. We will inherit much from him. Now, you don't have to do anything to inherit something. You just have to be somebody. And God makes us his sons which puts us in a position to inherit from him. Wonderful. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. Again, in the Old Testament, when God wanted to bless somebody, he said, I will be his God. He said to Solomon, when he first elevated Solomon to the throne, I will be his son. I will have a special relationship with Solomon. And God indeed blessed Solomon greatly. He was the, he was the greatest ruler of, of the world in his day. And we can look forward to similar blessings because we are his sons. But for the cowardly, and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and sexually immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars. And we could add many other characteristics of unbelievers here. That's the point. These are not holy. These are unsaved people. Their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, <clears throat> which is the second death. And we've already discovered that that is hell. That's eternal punishment in the lake of fire. So that's the first vision of the New Jerusalem. Now John gives us a second vision that he saw of the New Jerusalem. And if we go back to Genesis, we find again another parallel here. In chapter 1 of Genesis, we have a, a general description of, of um, creation. In Genesis 2, we have a recapitulation that emphasizes the creation of Eve, who was a bride for Adam. In the first vision that John saw of the New Jerusalem, it's an overview. But now he tells us more about the bride of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Verse 9 introduces us to the guide that showed, us, showed him around the city in his vision. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. There are seven references to the Lamb in chapters 21 and 22. And at this point, the Lamb becomes very prominent. Uh, Ann Ross Cousins wrote a, wrote a hymn, the, uh, the bride eyes not her garments, but her dear bridegroom's face. 
Um, he does not look at glory, but on the Prince of Grace. She does not look at glory, but on the Prince of Grace. Uh, the Lamb is all the glory in Emmanuel's land, she wrote. And the Lamb becomes the glory of the New Jerusalem. Now we get some physical features of the city. Remember, it's a vision. It's a vision that represents what our heavenly home that Christ went to the cross to prepare for us is going to be like. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain so that he would have a good perspective on this city. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. It was a glorious city. Robert Mounts wrote, The descent is an announcement in visionary terms of a future event which will usher in the eternal state. That the city comes down from God means that the eternal blessedness is not an achievement of man, but a gift from God. You see the contrast here between Babylon and Jerusalem, the self-made city and the God-given city. Her brilliance was like a very valuable stone, like a stone of crystal clear jasper. We call that a diamond today. It had a great high wall with 12 gates. In John's day, they built walls around city for, cities for protection. So the image here is of a very secure place with a big wall around it. And this wall <coughs> provides protection for the ones who are inside. With 12 gates, and at the gates were 12 angels guarding the gates, and, and names were written on the gates, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. So throughout eternity, Israel will be memorialized. The people of Israel will be recognized as people of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. This was unusual in John's day because Usually cities had very few gates to minimize the, the, the problem of invaders. So uh, I believe we're to conclude from this that there is uh, easy access into this city by those who come and go. This is not going to be a prison. It's going to, it's going to provide access and the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones on them. <clears throat> Who ever heard of a city with a foundation? We build houses with foundations. But uh, cities don't have foundations. This city is so permanent that it has 12 foundations whether these are stacked like pancakes or spread out around the wall, I don't know, but the image is quite clear. The point is, it's permanence. And on these foundation stones were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now this refers to Jesus' disciples. So people who are in the church will be recognized as being of the church throughout eternity as well. Old Testament saints, New Testament saints, we won't lose our individual identity or some of our history when we're in heaven, evidently. And the one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the, gate, it, the city and its gates and its wall. And the city was, is laid out as a square. And its length is as great as its width and he measured the city with a rod, 12,000 stadia, its length, width, and height are equal. Now 12,000 stadia 
is 1,500 miles. So this city has four sides, and it's 1,500 miles on each side. That's the distance between Dallas and Philadelphia, or Dallas and Los Angeles, Boston to Miami. I mean, that's gigantic. Who ever heard of such a city as this? Compare that with Babylon. Babylon was 15 miles on each side. This is going to be hundreds of times bigger and better than what man could produce on the earth. Whether this is going to be a pyramid or a cube is debated. Some have suggested it's going to be a pyramid because Babylon was uh, the, the highest temple in Babylon was about 600 feet <laughs> compared to the 1,500 miles of this city. Remember, the, par the, the, the uh, pyramids in Egypt were burial places. This city is going to be a place for the living. Others have seen it as a square because the Holy of Holies was a square. And uh, it was thought in the ancient world that a cube was a perfect uh, design. So whether that's intended or not, I don't know. But uh, those are facts. And he measured its wall, 144 cubits by, by human measurement, at 72 yards thick. A uh, football field's 100 yards, so this is three quarters of a football field thick. Obviously, what we are to conclude from this, it seems to me, is that <laughs> this is a secure place. This is a solid city. Nothing is going to destroy it forever because it's so huge and indestructible he says, 144 cubits by human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. An angel was doing the measuring, so he wanted to make sure John understood that these 144 cubits and 12,000 stadia were the same measurements as humans use, and not some fantastic angelic number. The material of the wall was jasper, Diamond, most valuable gem, gem to our way of thinking, and the city was pure gold like glass. Now, gold is interesting because uh, Nebuchadnezzar accumulated all kinds of gold. Uh, he, he did it mainly by conquest. He, uh, he brought great wealth into Babylon, greater than it had ever been before. But Solomon's wealth was greater than Nebuchadnezzar's. We read in the Old Testament that kings gave gifts to Solomon. Remember the Queen of Sheba coming with her gifts? And that every year, tons of gold were brought into Jerusalem under Solomon's reign. The temple was the Fort Knox of Jerusalem. It was just covered with gold. In fact, the, it, it, the floors were paved with gold in the temple. Unfortunately, Solomon's son was not a wise man. And uh, he did not have the same attitude toward God that Solomon did. And so during Rehoboam's reign, King Shishak of Egypt came in and he stripped the gold off the floors of the temple and from the sides of the temple. But during Solomon's reign, it was one huge glob of gold on the horizon. Can you imagine what it looked like in the rising sun and the setting sun? But this city will be pure gold. 
like clear glass. In John's day, glass was not always clear. It had um, impurities in it. So he compares it to the clearest kind of glass for purity. The foundations of the stones of the city were decorated with every kind of precious stone. Whoever heard of this? You don't decorate a foundation. You bury it. You cover it up with dirt. Uh, but here, even the foundation stones are brilliant. They're glorious. The first foundation stone was jasper, and then he gives us all 12 colors here through verse 20. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls. In John's day, the pearl was regarded as the greatest, most valuable gem because it was produced entirely by nature. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. Whether the gate dropped down from above or swung from the side, we don't know in his vision. But just imagine, and the streets what, the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. In John's day, 99% of, of the streets were dirt. The cheapest material. True, the Romans paved the major highways, but most of the streets in the Roman world were dirt. So, wow! A pure gold street in a pure gold city. How more glorious can you get? And I saw no temple in this city, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. No need to go to a place to worship God, because God will be there in person. Verses 23 through 27 talk about how the city will be lit. And the city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God has illuminated it. Jesus is the light of the world. And the lamp is the Lamb. J. Vernon McGee has said that this will be the Jesus Light and Power Company. <laughs> <laughs> He is all the glory in Emmanuel's land. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. It's another indication that perhaps we will still be known as Texans <laughs> in glory. <laughs> uh, we'll be known by our nations. Kings, people who have special honor on the earth, will be honored in heaven, and they will bring their honor uh, to the Lamb. In the daytime, for there will be no night there. Night has connotations of evil, you know. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Its gates will never be closed. And they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, and nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Many years ago, a doctor made a house call on a dying patient. And this patient asked him, Doctor, what will heaven be like? And the physician paused, trying to think of a helpful reply. And just then, they heard the sound of scratching at the closed door of the patient's bedroom. Do you hear that? The doctor asked. It's my dog. I left him downstairs, but he got impatient and came up here looking for me. He doesn't know what's in this room, but he knows his master is here. I believe that's how it, it is with heaven. We don't know exactly what it's like but we know that Jesus will be there, and really nothing else matters. How true. John's vision carries over into chapter 22, 
and he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal coming from the throne of God of the Lamb in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life. The tree of life appears in Genesis 3. Remember when Adam and Eve were excluded from the Garden of Eden? The entrance was barred by an angel to keep them from the tree of life because it is said there that the tree of life would enable them to live forever. So the tree of life is a symbol of eternal life. Bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. In other words, it's going to be perpetually fruitful. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing or for the health, the ongoing needs of the nations. There will no longer be any curse. That was introduced in Genesis 3. Now it's ended. And the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him. The following words were inscribed on a gravestone. Don't weep for me now, don't weep for me ever, for I'm going to do, some, some, I'm going to do nothing forever and ever. Some people think heaven will be a boring place. Others after years of exhausting work, look forward to doing nothing in heaven, <laughs> the ultimate retirement. <laughs> it's time that in heaven, it's true that in heaven we will rest from earthly labors, but it's not a place of inactivity. We will serve God throughout eternity. And they will see his face. This is a figure also taken from the Old Testament. Uh, when a king uh, granted favor to one of his subjects, he allowed him to appear in his presence. And this was described as seeing the face of the king. Remember, remember when Pharaoh excluded Moses from his presence, he said, you will not see my face again. So seeing the face of God refers to being in his presence we will probably see the face of Jesus since Jesus is still in his incarnate form and will be throughout eternity. I don't know whether we'll see God the Father or the Holy Spirit, but we will be with them and his name will be on their foreheads. That is, they will be notable for their identification with him, and there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illuminate them, and they will reign forever and ever. A young mother was trying to comfort her daughter when her pet kitten died. And she said, remember, dear, Fluffy is up in heaven now with God. But mommy, the girl sobbed, what in the world would God do with a dead cat? <laughs> There's a pragmatic little soul. So here we have paradise regained. In fact, things are going to be so much better in paradise than they were in the Garden of Eden that there is much to look forward to. So let's look back on this vision. Since what John saw was a vision, is the New Jerusalem only an imaginary place? Or is it a real place? Well, in other visions that other prophets saw, what they saw were real people, places, and objects. Therefore, I conclude that the New Jerusalem is a real place. It's the place that 
Jesus said he was going to prepare for his disciples and he would take them to it. We will go there at the rapture. It's not just a symbol of something such as eternal bliss, but it does have, it does use symbolic language to describe it. But are the streets really paved with gold? I think not. This seems to be one of the comparisons that John used to describe the great glory of the city. So what? What can we learn from this revelation of our future home? Well, we can look forward to a future in which there will be no sin or the consequences of it. Hallelujah. Our heavenly home will exceed all of our expectations. Paul wrote, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the mind of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But he has revealed them to us by his spirit. This is part of what he has revealed about what lies ahead of us. And even though it transcends our comprehension and even our imagination because of its vastness and beauty, yet it is a reality. The best thing about heaven will be that we will forever be with our loving God. We will see his face. We will be with him in this wonderfully secure place. Well, this brings us to verse 6, which is the end of the book. Now, we're done with visions. We've been seeing visions ever since we began chapter 4. But visions have ended, and now John is talking again to his original recipients of this letter, the seven churches of Asia Minor, and beyond them to us today. And he said to me, these words are faithful and true. He repeats this. <laughs> I, I think it's because this is so staggering. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his bondservants the things which must soon take place. In view of what follows in verse 7, I take it that the angel here, our messenger, is Jesus himself. He's the one that was sent by God in chapter 1 with all of this revelation. He says he's going to show things which must soon take place. Well, friends, it's been almost 2,000 years, right? How can this be true? Well, the word soon is the key to it because it doesn't necessarily mean immediately. It can also be translated at any time. At any time, without delay, this could happen. We, point, we had a discussion of the imminency of Christ's return earlier in our study of Revelation. And this comes back to it. He's not setting a date here. He's not saying it's going to happen in the next week or month or year or decade or century. He says it could happen at any time. It's an overhanging event, which can happen at any time. The Greek word taki, takai is, is translated quickly in the next verse. Same word. Behold, I am coming quickly at any time without delay. Blessed is the one who keeps or follows the words of the testimony of the prophecy of this book. So here's the final blessing in the book. It's the one who pays attention to the words of this prophecy and who lives in the light of it. 
That's the testimony of the angel. Now we have the testimony of John in verses 8 through 11. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. He did this before, remember? And he said to me, do not do that. Get up off your knees. I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brothers, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Daniel chapter 12 records God's words to Daniel saying, seal up the book, because it's not time for these things to be fulfilled. Now he says, don't seal it up because it's time for everybody to know what's coming. As an artist covers his work before it's finished, and then uncovers it to do some more, God did with his prophetic revelation. He gave much through Daniel, covered it up for a while, came back to it in Revelation. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong, the one who is filthy still be filthy, let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness. The one who is holy still keep himself holy. This is a rather difficult uh, translation to understand. Basically, it means repent before Christ comes. I like the way uh, Henry Sweet described it. It is not only true that the troubles of the last days will tend to fix the character of each individual according to the habits which he has formed, but there will come a time when change will be impossible. Remember Pharaoh of the Exodus. He could not repent after a while. And this verse warns of that. When no further opportunity will give it, be given for repentance on the one hand or for apostasy on the other, for departure from God. Verses 12 through 20 give the testimony of Jesus and John's response to that. Behold, Jesus says, I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me. There's that word again, quickly, at any time. Paul said it could happen at the twinkling of an eye, 1 Thessalonians 4. Remember, he's talking here about the rapture. We're out of the visions. We're not talking about the second coming anymore. We're talking about the Lord's coming for his people, us, now. And my reward is with me to reward each one as his work deserves. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. A grandson was visiting one day when he asked his grandmother, do you know how you and God are a lot, a lot alike? She mentally polished her halo <laughs> and said, no, how are we alike? He said, you're both old. <laughs> I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you of these things. For the churches, I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. These are titles of Jesus that go back to Isaiah 11.1, 1, Matthew 2.2, 2, the bright morning star. Um, Balaam prophesied that a star would arise in the east. When the wise men came from the east, they saw a star over the, over the city of Bethlehem. And uh, Jesus compares himself to the last star in the night that is the brightest one before a new day dawns, which is usually the, the planet Venus. He's called that also in Revelation 2.28. The spirit and the bride, here the bride is the churches, say, come, come Lord Jesus, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty 
come. If you have a need in your life, if you are thirsting, come to Jesus. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without cost. This is one of the most beautiful gospel invitations in the whole Bible. Look at it. If you have a desire, take the water of life. Life that satisfies completely. It's without cost because it costs Jesus everything. And he gives it to us. Evangelist George Needham was once asked to visit a certain rich and socially prominent man. Upon arriving at the wealthy man's house, the preacher found him to be very busy. So he apologized for the intrusion, but inquired if he had time for one quick question. Receiving the man's permission, Needham asked, are you saved? No, replied the rich man, but I'm trying to be a Christian. How long have you been trying? Needham asked. For 12 years, came the answer. To that, the evangelist responded, permit me to say that you've been very foolish. Taken aback by this statement, the other asked, what do you mean by that? Needham calmly re explained, well, you've been trying for so many years that you haven't succeeded. If I were you, I would give up trying and start trusting. As the evangelist left the man's home, he wondered if this brief conversation had been worthwhile. But that evening, to Needham's surprise, the rich man came to the church where he was preaching. His face reflected a look of peace and joy that the evangelist hadn't seen earlier in the day. After the meeting, the visitor said to Needham, I've been foolish indeed, wasting 12 precious years of life, vainly trying when salvation could have been mine simply by trusting. Let the one who desires take the water of life. It's without cost. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. He's going to have trouble. The cults ought to read this verse. Adding the Book of Mormon, science and health with key of the scriptures, of equal value with scripture, to adherence to those cults, is dangerous business. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life. He won't lose his salvation, but he'll lose a part of what could be his if he remained faithful. That is part of his reward and from the holy city which are written in this book. Robert Thomas wrote, no book in the Bible has a more pointed attestation, a stronger safeguarding against tampering, or a more urgent recommendation for study and observance than does the apocalypse. Revelation, especially in its epilogue. We go back to verse 3 of chapter 1. Blessed is the one who reads and who, those who hear the words of the prophecy and keeps the things which are written in it for the time is near. Verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly without delay, at any time. John echoes, come, Lord Jesus. I don't know about you, but I pray that every day. And verse 21 is the final benediction of the book. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all, be with all, amen. And isn't it interesting that we've been reading of how much God gives in these chapters. The book began, verse 4 of chapter 1, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come. And it ends on the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with all. It's all about grace.
Preparing to move has reminded me about preparing for heaven. Both activities involve joyful expectation, downsizing, <laughs> getting rid of non-essentials, and doing a little to prepare one day at a time. That's how the study of this book has helped me. And before we pray, let me read you this short poem that William Doan wrote. I'm not looking for the sunset as the swift years come and go. I'm looking for the sunrise and the golden morning glow. I'm not going down but upward, and the path is never dim, for the day proves ever brighter as I journey on with him. So my eyes are on the hilltops, waiting for the sun to rise, waiting for my invitation to my home beyond the skies. Father, we thank you for this revelation of the future that you have given us, and especially for this glimpse into the glories of the place that you have gone ahead to prepare and have promised to return and take you there with yourself. We look forward to that great day and we pray that as we do, we will be inspired to lay aside earthly things and to live for the future for your well done, good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.